My name is Steve Hawk. I'm a writer and an art dealer and a farmer journalist and reporter. I'd like to talk a little bit today about John Steinbeck and his relationships with artists. This is something that I got interested in in 1998 when I co-curated with Patricia Leach the opening show at the National Steinbeck Center, the opening art exhibit called This Side of Eden, Images of Steinbeck's California. We wanted paintings that reflected Steinbeck's period, the 1930s, and we set out word to the underground of the art world, pickers and people that found art in different places. And we got probably 40 or 50 paintings from that area. We got another 20 or 30 from museums. And it was really interesting because not only did they relate to what Steinbeck was writing, as what Steinbeck was re writing related to what they did, but we found out that many of those artists, or at least a good, goodly number, were friends of Steinbeck or had been companions or knew him along the route to, to, to creating. It shouldn't be a surprise that Steinbeck liked art and artists. He is probably one of the best literary landscapists America has ever produced. He, he has a great sense of place and time, whether it's urban or country, are the field workers, or the mountains of California, the hills of California. The other thing is, he liked his portrait done. He was a, a bit egocentric in that way. There are a lot of portraits of him. One of the first artists that he became a good friend with was James Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was from the East Coast, and in 1920, as a merchant marine or merchant seaman, he ended up in Monterey. He established a studio. There's a wonderful picture, probably from the early 30s, of Ricketts, James Fitzgerald, and Steinbeck being on Canterbury Row. And they've done kind of a makeshift band. They're holding pots and pans and horns, and they're all gaunt. You can tell it's a depression era, nobody's fat. They're, they're, they're pretty slim. Fitzgerald's famous for other reasons, though. He eventually went back east and is, is considered one of America's greatest watercolors. But before he went back in 1934, he did a portrait of Steinbeck that is in the National Portrait Gallery and considered very important. In 1934 also, Bruce and Jean Aris moved down from the San Francisco Bay Area. And Bruce was a fine, fine painter, and Jean was a really lovely writer. Years later, she did a novel called The Shattered Glass, which is a little bit about early Monterey in that time. And you can pick through the book and, and maybe guess that this person might be that person or that character might be that character. Bruce was a very powerful painter. And if you go down, down to Canary Row, even today there's a Bruce Harris Way that leads to Ed Ricketts' lab. And also there are banners all along the row of Ricketts and Steinbeck and sardine boats, and those are all drawings by Bruce Harris. Bruce, in 1939, did a painting called Lower Alvarado Street, Monterey, which is the same year that Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath came out. And the painting in some ways is almost as powerful. It shows heroin being used, there's prostitution, there's sailors. It's a rough, rough thing. A newsboy is, is selling newspapers. It's interesting painting. I actually think that Bruce, in a way, meeting Steinbeck and hanging out with Ricketts and being part of that group, hurt him as an artist because he never painted as much as he should have. He started getting into writing, into literary magazines, and just never painted enough. What he did paint, he did a lot of murals. Many of those were destroyed by fires. He built a theater on the wharf that was also destroyed by fire. And later in his life, his house was destroyed by fire. Also about that time in the 30s, John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts took a trip to Mexico. And on the way, they stopped in Ventura, California at the post office and they were to buy stamps or to post some letters. And there were two young artists from St. Louis, Elwood Graham and Judith Dean. At the time, she called herself Barbara Stevenson. She later became Judith Dean. So when I say one name, it's, it's interchangeable with the other. And they were doing a WPA mural, and John and, and Ed spoke to them and, and found the work very interesting and said, if you're ever looking for a place to settle as artists, come to the Monterey Peninsula. Well, they got up there within a year or so, and they settled. And they became part of the group at Ed Ricketts Lab, uh, Pacific Biological Laboratories on Cannery Row. And they also became 
important Steinbeck portraitist. But first, Steinbeck sent them to Mexico several times. He gave them money and he told them to learn how to paint out loud. This is kind of a good example of his support of artists, which I think is, think is interesting. After the trip to the Sea of Cartes with Ed Ricketts, John and, and Ricketts came back and everybody was at the lab and apparently there was partying for two or three days. And Steinbeck realized this was not constructive. And he said to Judith and Elwood, look, you always wanted to do my portrait. Why don't I sit down and do the notes for Sea of Cartes and you do my portrait? And they actually did this. They sat down in a room and Steinbeck could actually work on his notes as Elwood and Judith did his paintings. Judith's portrait is now at the Martha Heasley Cox Center for Steinbeck Studies at San Jose State. It shows John writing. Elwood Graham's portrait, which shows Steinbeck almost trembling psychologically, seemingly troubled. It's a very psychological painting. It is missing. It has been missing for years. John Houston, the film director, tried to buy it from Elwood at one point. That was a story. He wasn't able to do it. It was said it was won or lost in a poker game. Nobody knows where it is, but it's a great portrait. And if anybody ever finds it, it would be, be quite a find. Hopefully, it has not been destroyed. When they reached their late 30s and 40s, Elwood and Judith divorced and went their separate ways. Elwood stayed here. Judith traveled in Europe with the gypsies and event eventually returned here but then went to Mexico. Both Elwood and Judith just died in the last few years at around the age of 95 or 96. So kind of amazing longevity. Judith did another painting of Monterey and Canterbury that's very important. It's called The Argument. One night she heard men arguing on the row and that's where her studio was and she came out and she did this very strong gestural painting where, where people's arms are like this and that and that and they're arguing and there's a man over to the side watching them with a goatee. And she said later that symbolically and spiritually it was probably Ed Ricketts that she was thinking of because he was kind of a peacemaker and he tried to break up fights. And in this particular painting he's wearing a goatee and there's kind of a funny story about that and that Steinbeck said once that Ed was in love with a young woman who felt he had a weak chin so he grew a goatee. And Steinbeck said that didn't help anything, that he now looked half like a goat and half like Jesus Christ. So later we think Ricketts took that off, got rid of that. Another artist that, that was at the lab at times, in addition to the photographer Edward Weston, by the way, he would show up, was August Gay, who was a member of a group called the Society of Six. He was kind of a mentor to Bruce Harris. He was older and he was originally from France, came over as a young boy, and just had this kind of wonderful quiet demeanor, but, but again a very, very modernist painter. And Steinbeck said of him that the wonderful thing about August Gay is he treated everyone the same. He said you could be a bum off the street or you could be the Queen of England and he would just be the same to you. He would treat you in a nice, civil, but quiet way. Another artist that figured in Steinbeck's life when he was here was Armin Hansen. Hansen was probably 15 or 20 years older than Steinbeck. He was a big, powerful man. He had shipped out on fishing boats in Europe when he studied in Germany. When he came to Monterey, his main subject was the Monterey fishermen. He realized the risk of life and the dangers, and he was very passionate about it. Another painter who was important at that time was Elmer Hader. Elmer was born in Pajaro, California and that's also in Monterey County. Most writers, if you're getting published, you start getting interested in illustration. Who's going to do the cover of your book? What's it going to look like? And Steinbeck was never happy with Cup of Gold. He felt that the artist made it look like a child's book and he didn't think it was a child's book. So from that point on, he took an active interest in whoever would illustrate the cover of his book or special editions. He had seen a book by Hayter, a child's book, and he liked the cover. So when it came to the Long Valley, Hayter did a cover of one of those. When it came to Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck wanted Elmer Hayter again. Hayter submitted two watercolors. One became the one that's almost an icon now, the Jode family looking over the valley, the packed car in front of them, 
looking across the distance. It's got a sense of loneliness and isolation and adventure. And Elmer Hader did that. An interesting side story on that is about 10 years ago, I got a call from an auction house in San Francisco. And they had the original watercolor for that, for that cover by Elmer Hader. And they asked me what I thought it should auction for. And they only did that because I had done the Steinbeck show. And they thought I would know. And they said the problem was is that it was an iconic image, but Elmer Hader had never had anything sell for over more than three or $4,000. I said it is an iconic image, and I think it should be thirty dollars to $35,000. They said that seems a bit much, but we'll put that on as an estimate. It ended up selling for $65,000. And whoever got it, I think, got a good deal because I think someday it could sell for 200000 You know, it's just, just that kind of wonderful watercolor. Hayter later did the cover for The Winner of Our Discontent. Like Steinbeck, he and his wife settled on the East Coast, and they did children's books, and they won the Caldecott Award. A, a little bit sad because they did children's books, and they had a little boy, and he died at the age of three. And, and it took a lot for them to kind of pull out and continue to do children's books without a, a child. Another artist who was, who was very important in, in illustrating for Steinbeck was Peggy Worthington Best. Her husband was an editor for Viking Press and was also a good friend of Norman Rockwell's. And we're pretty sure Steinbeck met her through her husband. And he chose her to do a special edition of Tortilla Flat. And the paintings from that, there were about 35 images, are scattered across the country. We've seen three or four. It would be kind of a wonderful grouping to put together. But the paintings are so good and so Monterey, you know she came here and she spent some time here. Very important artist was Maynard Dixon. Dixon was married to Dorothea Lange. They would come into Monterey and Pacific Grove and Pebble Beach in the late 1920s and early 1930s. We know this because Dorothy Lang did a portrait of Francis McComas, who lived in Pebble Beach in 1928. In 1934, Maynard Dixon did a painting called No Place to Go. As powerful as Steinbeck was with Grapes of Wrath, and, and it was the most powerful statement of that period, there was a group of painters called American Scene Painters that were California painters. Some of them worked for the studios and then in their own time would go out and do paintings of civil unrest, of labor strikes, of workers in the fields. Dixon was, instead of one of those people, he was a great Western artist, I think maybe the greatest of the Western artists. And he did these paintings, though, before the Western, or in between, and partially, I'm sure, influenced by Dorothea Lange, and maybe he influenced her, of the down and out. And some of the paintings were called things like down and out, no place to go, the hobo on the road. Dixon apparently at one point wrote Steinbeck after Tritia Flat was published, he said, why does Danny have to die? Why, why is the house burned down? And if I could, I want to read something because Steinbeck wrote back to him, and I, I think it's really interesting because it says something about the creative process. He says, and this is 1935, he says to Maynard, that noble man from Mr. and Mrs. Smithers, July 1935, so he's calling himself and Carol Smithers, he's at Pacific Grove, California, so he's writing from the little house on 11th Street. He says, Maynard, the answer is that I'm not going to do anything about it. The house is gone and Danny is dead and there's an end of it. It wasn't my fault, it might happen to anyone. I'm sorry, but there it is. Swell of you to write a thousand times better than reviewing Dribble. Thanks for it, and I'm sorry, really sorry for Danny's death, but there it is, and I have no power of raising him. He really was, you see. Sincerely, John Steinbeck. So that's, he just felt like he, he couldn't deviate from what had really happened. Dixon, Dixon was almost as powerful a painter as, as Steinbeck was a novelist, and if, if they got together and there were other letters and things, they would be a treasure. I've just mentioned some of the artists that, that, that Steinbeck knew. There, there are many, many. There, there are a number of portraits of him. We know he was a, a friend of Miguel Covarrubias, the great Mexican artist. 
I'm sure there are many others. He went into Mexico a lot of times. But I think his, his greatest period with artists was on the Monterey Peninsula, was Judith Deem, Elwood Graham, Bruce Aris, Armin Hansen, those people. Also, he couldn't have walked along the shores of the Monterey Peninsula in those days without seeing painters like Burton Boundy and E. Charlton Fortune and Evelyn McCormick. He must have known them all, spoken to them. It was very, just very, very rich at time and period.